start with the monthly chart so we can kind of see where we are. We're, you know, a year plus into bear market. So we want to see, kind of do an assessment and see kind of what things look like. So we zoom out, we can see the secular bull market starting way back here. A lot of very low volatility, slow uptrends in there. The occasional cyclical bear market here, here. Um, I guess we're, this bear market right now has obviously lasted longer um, than prior ones that we've had during the secular bull run. So the question will be, um, over the next six months, will this end up being labeled another cyclical bear market or secular? Um, really will depend on kind of what happens with the macro over the next six months and, and the Fed and earnings and everything. Um, so, um, but what we can see on the spies is we came into the, you know, the multi-year uptrend on the monthly. If we zoom in, uh, we had a nice bounce um, in October. The spies put in the low, the S&P put in the low in October. And since then, been, you know, gyrating up and down, but now we broke to the upside. And now as we look at this chart here, you're probably starting to think, wow, I've seen charts that look like this in the daily time frame or the intraday time frame. And yep, there've been quite a few. Um, it's, you know, classic reversal pattern. Um, you're in a downtrend. Uh, you try to reverse and bounce like we did here on back in July. We had that June bottom, strong month in July. August started really strong. You can see the wick on the monthly right here. This was the August high. We made a new low, came back up, held higher. And so you have this reversal pattern setting up with, you know, let's see, we're at the beginning of February now. Let's see where February ends up closing. Um, very possible. This wick that's developing here could be similar to August um, where you get the wick and you get the reversal and you get a weaker close. Does it mean we're going back down here? No, that's, you know, we need to see earnings. We need to see a recession. Earnings come down more. We need to see um, re-acceleration of inflation. Potentially a lot of things would have to happen um, to get the market to take out these lows. Um, so that's that's kind of on that. If we go to the zoom into the daily, you can see the October low a little more, more clearly. Um, I started talking about um, probably in this bounce here. And then again, four weeks ago when this bounce started, this idea that, you know, we could have a bounce back up to the August highs and people will get really bullish. Um, and that will be the greatest risk reward on a short entry um, because you will get a pullback of some sort. And potentially, if you start to get some macro cooperating factors, um, you might get a really a nice size pullback. So even if we, if we zoom in on, um, you know, back in, go back in time a little bit, and we look at the June low, you know, the kind of the nice nice pop off of the June low, the higher low here, failure to break through the initial bounce high, um, a failure to break down, and then eventually taking out the bounce high here in the middle of July, coming into July earnings season. And at that point, I'm not remembering what we're talking about. So we're saying, okay, stuff is strong. We're now coming into the big boys reporting this week that basically just occurred. And we came in with strength into that week and we went higher. And then we went higher for a couple more weeks. And at that point, I think people were saying, oh, this is, you know, when this signal happens, the market retraces this much, that the bear market's over, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's not how statistics work. So you can't, like, you know, you say a, a, you know, a few examples. Um, and now we actually went back down to the low. We made a new low. Um, and now we're coming back up here. So what we have is a very strong market starting here um, on this day right here. Remember, we're consolidating. We'll see it more clearly on the queues where we're consolidating at the low, but we're consolidating on the spies just nowhere near the low. And this had two ways to go. It could either, either break to the downside here or to the upside. It broke to the upside. And since then, you know, you see a couple of red bars. And this was a nice day of selling. We had the gap down, and then we resumed the uptrend. We had a gap down on this day. We had some selling, and then we resumed the uptrend. Like I, this, about four weeks now into this. This is, I guess, four weeks in a day. So this is, or maybe it's 28 trading days, because we have one day the market was closed for Martin Luther King. Um, so we have 28 trading days. No, 20 trading days, sorry, um, four weeks, 28 calendar days, where the buyers, you know, asserted control and we are in a trend. And so, you know, if we zoom in on the 30 minute, it looks like a rising wedge. <laughs> so um, higher highs, higher lows. And, you know, we've had several, well, first of all, this one here, the first pullback um, after we broke to the top of this consolidation was a test just at the top. Uh, then we started a trend here, um, hard one day pullback gap down. Um, and then we basically started to form an uptrend. You know, we're making higher high, higher high, higher high, higher low, higher low, higher low. Higher low. We'll see where this, you know, I do think that it's very reasonable to assume that regardless of this, you know, the high from last week is the high, or if we move into this the 420 to 425 area, that a retest of like 400 to 405, like that's that's how I'm thinking about it. So get people nervous, maybe even flush through 400, and then, then we'll kind of see. So the cues, you know, we were in a strong downtrend. Here's the monthly technology. We talked about this a bunch of times, just was in this enormous, just incredible run. This is a log chart. You can kind of see it. There's a double, a double. Um, a double and you know doubled three times um started to ride you know kind of trend outside of the uptrend channel um it wasn't until we hit the bear market last year um that we actually got back inside of the channel so you know we we're still outside of it even in q1 last year you know in april it broke through um and we came to the bottom of the channel here and so and that's when in october i posted that monthly chart um where you know maybe maybe we will hold the bottom of the channel or, or slice through it like we had a couple of times prior and catch a bit and then maybe over the next year we can start to you know, move back towards the top of the channel um and kind of earnings will have a chance to catch up anytime you have a trend like this earnings you know over a multi-year period, that means earnings, you're going to have a lot of earnings growth. The issue is, you know, does the price start to outpace the earnings growth, which most likely was happening here? And so maybe the, the Qs, I'm just making this up, I don't know what the Qs trade out as a multiple, but maybe it had the Qs at a 25p, and then maybe, you know, it, maybe it was like 20 at the bottom of the channel and 26 at the top, and maybe got to like the low 30s up here, 
and it just needed to come back in. And now obviously earnings estimates have come down um, on these names on pretty much all of them, I think. Um, and so now that that even though it's come back down, maybe the multiple is you know above 30 or something like that. So the question will become over the next four or five quarters, do they resume the earnings got the earnings growth start to reaccelerate again after a couple of weeks quarters, or does it not? Um, did they actually guide down further into a recession? And that's what kind of gets you to pass the low and then potentially take out take out the low. So that's a bigger picture. Um, if we zoom in on the daily, so we were, you know, we we're consolidating here at the low, here or just above the low. Here's the low, that reversal day um, in October, um, rolled over again, put in a higher low, but we didn't start a trend here. We basically we had a lot of selling, whatever this was in the, like the mid-290s, kind of where it broke down from previously back in September. Um, we had a gap up day here. Um, that was the day CPI, that overreaction day, which was I found to be shocking how much we went up on that decent CPI brand. We were actually up here at 299.300 in the pre market. Um, we were sold all day, and that was the beginning of us. You know, this is where people became bearish. Even I, I was pretty acknowledged that you come down like this, and then you fail to bounce, and then you spend like a week down here. Um, that's not good. That looks like you're going to test the low, or you know. So um, we put down this Friday. We gapped down. You know, selling two hundred three days hard selling. We gapped down um, to here. We sold right on the open, but we held two sixty, and we closed at two sixty nine, and like that was it. You know, and to me, like part of my job through the morning meeting and talking to the traders is saying, hey, that's that's different guys and trying to get people to like kind of buy in over the next week or two to say, Hey, like maybe we should be looking for different setups. Maybe we should be buying stuff on pullbacks and things like that. Um, I think by, by, by here, definitely people's attitude started to change, but people didn't want to chase. Um, but that's when people started like trading small caps and then looking for things like lower price things to break out and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, a few days, this was the first pullback attempt since we started bouncing right here and immediately was erased with, you know, a stronger, as hard as the selling was here with the buying was stronger. If the buying is stronger than the selling, you know, and also obviously all these days of buying that preceded it, like you're in an uptrend. And so the question becomes what's going to happen. Uh, when we get back up to like this area here or the day where we sold off from that CPI print. And the first time we got up there, you know, we failed. Um, and then we added this day of selling. And then um, on the Fed day, the other day, we just, we closed above it. You know, things are extremely overbought now. That's why um, I, I tried to short the queues a few times yesterday. Um, and it wasn't until the third time that it actually worked quite well. The first few times it dropped like a dollar quickly, then made new highs. And that's kind of where we are. So here. So let's see what happened yesterday. So we just were so extended here. So some selling came in in front of, you know, I think I, I, I said this in the morning meeting yesterday, like why did we get sold here? Well, we had, you know, Apple, Amazon, and Google reporting after the close. We had just gone from 293 to 313. So we went up like 20 points on the queues. It's normal to like take some profits. If the numbers are good, I can buy tomorrow morning, you know, whatever, a little bit lower, a little bit higher. Um, and so, you know, the next one, oh, also we have the jobs number too. So the jobs number comes out. I just, it's very implausible that we actually had over 500,000 jobs created. So maybe that'll get revised down to 300 or something. Because it was such a strong number and because we ran up a bunch in the prior few days, of course, the initial reaction is going to be a sell because the Fed is going to be like, whoa, not only are we not getting rising unemployment, we're still getting falling unemployment. We're at 50, 60 year lows. This is not good. Now, the silver lining was, I think there showed that there was no wage pressure in the numbers. I didn't actually go through the numbers, but I saw a couple of people tweet that. And so, okay, well, no wage pressure. That's really what the Fed cares about. Let's buy. <laughs> and so we bought, you know, people think that we bought up to like, you know, where we kind of rolled over from the prior day and we rolled over again. So, you know, when I come, we come in on Monday, we'll have like, you know, we have this resistance up here. Let's call it 310 to 312 on Thursday and Friday. And if we can't get, you know, an hour close on the hourly back above 310, we're probably going to be testing, you know, this at a minimum the low from Friday morning, you know, more likely the, the, the support from Wednesday afternoon. Um, and that's, you know. Today's trade is titled After the Dust Settles, Swing Trade Strategy. It is what I call a pullback swing trade. What we do is identify a hot stock. We enter after a multi-day pullback. We don't go full size until we have confirmation from the price action. And we're going to share some targets as well as stops. Before we get into the analysis of this trade, I want to discuss some of the questions we're going to answer during our discussion. Number one, who is in control? Are buyers in control or are sellers in control? When we see buyers in control, stocks are moving higher in an uptrend. When sellers are in control, we see stocks moving lower in a downtrend. When there's more equilibrium, we see sideways action, which is known in trading as consolidation. What clues do we see for change, meaning change of balance from buyer to seller or seller to buyer? How do we control our risk? Where do we press our bets when we have some price action confirmation? And when is the trade over? When is it time to take profits, move on, not look to put on more risk? Those are some of the things that we're going to cover in our discussion of the trade today. Before we go, it is a hot stock, um, which means that it has very large outsized moves in short periods of time because people are piling into it. And then when it runs out of momentum, people pile out. This creates a lot of volatility. As short-term traders, our lifeblood is volatility as well as liquidity. And that gives us amazing risk-reward trading opportunities. So if we take a look at our first chart today, it's a multi-week, 30-minute chart. The stock first came on our radar a few weeks ago when it had a very large breakout move when it doubled from 30 to 60 in a couple of days. Our focus back then, when it was above $55 a share or so, was looking for a pullback. And then over the coming days, it had a very large pullback. And it was setting up for what I call when the dust settles swing trade. And what I mean by when the dust settles is a stock like that that has incredible momentum to the upside, when people start to exit, 
in pylon, you get the snowball effect, and it comes down and down. It's, becomes, it's, it's a dangerous, it can be a dangerous thing to buy. Many traders will call this catching a falling knife. But once the dust settles, we'll see some changes in price action. We'll be able to put on a swing trade with an appropriate amount of risk and really capture the second wave, the second time that it moves higher. Because generally speaking, when you have a hot stock like this that breaks out and doubles in price, and then has a large pullback, that's not the end of it. That's not the last we hear from it. It will have another up move. It may not go back up to the, the prior high, but at a minimum, we'll look for a 30 to 50% retracement moving back up, and we want to take advantage of that. So. As you can see, I've marked up this multi-week 30 minute and I've highlighted a few points, one through five. The first point is actually where I initiated um, a small initial position. And that is because if we look at this multi-week chart, you can see that it consolidated for two weeks in this area before it went up and doubled in price. And that's, you know, generally speaking, that's when I'm going to start to initiate a position, especially in this case where the stock had sold off for about six days in a row coming into that level where I got long, which I think was around $28, $29 a share in that range. I actually tweeted it out, simple short tweet because I was busy watching the stock uh, on long, long Fubo uh, on January 4th. And then what you can see is also the amount of selling, um, the, volume, the volume was increasing from the time that it broke out to the upside, and there was a crescendo of volume, very high volume, uh, on the day that I bought. And I also like that because at that point, I thought that most of the people who needed to get out of the stock um, who had gotten in in the prior week um, were most likely out, and we were getting close to the bottom. The next day after I had initiated my position, it actually traded below the prior day's low, which triggered an exit for me, with the exception of a very small piece of the position, which I wanted to hold, under the understanding that, generally speaking, it was coming down into an area where I thought, the seller should be exhausted, and I like to hold the last piece because I find that when I hold a small portion of the original position, even if it's hit my stop, that I'll pay attention um, for a change in the price action. And once I see a change in the price action, I will reinitiate or add to the small position, increase in size. And as I get further price confirmation from the price action, that control is starting to move from totally in seller's control towards more equilibrium with buyers and sellers uh, more balanced, and we'll see sideways action then I will start to increase my position again, but I won't go full size until buyers start to take control overall. And so what you can see is as I marked up this first chart, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.5, 0 0.2 is on the, on the following day, um, on January 5th or 6th, they actually raised guidance. You can see huge volume actually there. That was actually the peak of the volume where people rushed back in. It got back up to 30 resistance, where it topped out in the prior um, after hours. And once it had topped out there, then I had a workable range. I knew that 26 had been a buy area for two weeks before it broke out and gone to 60. I knew that now the, the buyers stepped in on their release of their guidance. Um, and the reason why a company will release guidance after it has a large down move like that, generally speaking, is they may be about to raise, raise capital. They want people to know that the fundamentals are still strong with the company. Um, and so that's another thing that professional traders uh, and investors will be looking at, like, oh, they released guidance early. I wonder if perhaps it will be raising um, capital soon, and that's something that I'm going to, to keep an eye on. Um, and so over the next few days, what you can see is it was bouncing back and forth between $26 and $30, and I labeled 0.3 and 0.4. When it's pulling back at that point to $26, I'm watching, I'm bidding into $26, because I believe we're moving now after this large downtrend that we saw over a six or seven day period with lower highs and lower lows. We've now started to move sideways. I have a consolidation that occurred a few weeks ago where it held that area and it had an explosive move. And so even if I'm not looking for a move back up to $60, what we talked about several times in our morning meeting was, once this gets above $30 and starts to hold, we'll look for a move into the mid-30s, where we'll take a bunch of profits, and then we'll kind of see what happens from there and see if we can go up a little bit higher. And so that was kind of the mindset. So on the, on the fifth or sixth day, um, we actually had another catalyst. Um, they had announced that they were acquiring um, another company, um, the market liked that, and I labeled that 0.5, and we shared that in the morning meeting. I think I shared that on Twitter again, and it moved back above $30. What we'll do is we'll zoom in on a multi-day 30 minutes, so we can see this, we can see the price action much better. So you can see on the left side, the six days of selling, we can see the first day of buying, and then we can see that nice consolidation for a four or five day period. And the great thing about that is if you have conviction in this trade, meaning you believe that once the people who needed to get out got out, the ones who chased it from you know, 40 to 60, they're out and it's coming back down to an area where we saw a lot of accumulation, you can use that accumulation area to build up a large position and control your risk. And the reason you can control your risk is once it's moved off of the low on the left part of that consolidation that I've circled there, moved up to 30 and failed, we know that that, that move um, on the first day it showed buying was from 26 to 30. So we know if we buy into 26 on the following day, which is what I did, my risk there is very little. Um, when it's moving down from the 50s all the way down into the 20s, very hard to control your risk. Where do I put my stop? Do I risk a dollar? Do I risk $2? What do I risk? Well, once it's come down and we've seen buyers step in at a very important level where it was accumulated previously, we can risk 50 cents or less. And we can start to accumulate with the buyers there. And we can add to our position each time it holds at that price. And then we can wait to go max size until we actually have a news catalyst, which we see at the right side of this chart. And we also have a price that we have to see it hold above. So in the open, when it has a strong drive above $30, what I like to see is it go up to 31 or 32, meaning there are buyers willing to really chase it above 30. And when it pulls back down to $30, if there are bids in that 30 area, I'm going to go with more size. I'm going to put in a stop below 29.50. And again, remember, we're long from that 26, 27 area. We've accumulated a bunch. At that point, we are three, four dollars in the money. So we can size up here above $30 and understand even if we take a loss on that ad below 29.50, we're still way in the money making a profit. Don't make this rookie error. If you're accumulating stock between 26 and 27, and then you have a news catalyst and it gets above 30, and you're adding to that position, 
Just hit out of the position that you added above 30 below 29.50. Do not hit out of your shares that you're accumulating at much lower prices. You would need to see a reversal from this area to consider taking that stock off. And what I mean by that is at least getting down below $29. And I would say even, even below 28.50 or 28 would be where I would have a stop for the, those shares that we accumulated in the 26. We want to give this trade a chance to move back up into the mid-30s over the next couple of days. After buying on that pullback to 30, um, after it shows us the strength in the pre-market and right on the open, um, then we're looking for periods of consolidation intraday where we can add to the position as well. Remember, on these smaller, just like we had this large multi-day consolidation um, on the higher time frame for a swing position, we can add to our profits quite a bit. And this is where there's a huge advantage to developing intraday trading skills. Um, when you're talking about swing trade risk reward, you know, we're talking about two to one is a very nice risk reward, three to one is a great risk reward. But when we get into the intraday time frame, when we really drill down, we can increase our, our risk, risk reward on trades greater than five to one, sometimes 10 or 15 to one. And where the top intraday traders separate themselves is they'll identify very tight periods of consolidation. And they might, let's say they had a two or 3,000 share position going into that tight consolidation. They might increase their position to 15 or 20,000 shares um, because they know the same way that I was talking to you about you know, risking at $30 to below $29.50, if we get a very tight consolidation like we did in this particular stock right at $31 in a 20 cent range, we can even risk maybe 15 cents accumulating in that tight consolidation and really up our size and take advantage if it breaks to the upside. And so that's what happened here between 12 and one o'clock. We had a really, really tight consolidation um, after the stock had attempted to roll over, held 30 again. Buyers stepped up once, they stepped up twice. You can see I circled that area, very tight consolidation. And that's where top traders will accumulate a position or they will wait for the break of that really tight consolidation and let's just lay in with a very large buy order and put in a stop order below that very tight consolidation. And what happened in this case, it happened to work out. So if a trader increased their position by four or five X at that point, and then you can see the stock actually popped about $4 right at the end of the day, that's a 15 or 20 times in terms of the risk, initial risk of putting that on. And that's really where the top upper echelon, top few percent traders separate themselves from just the very good, very profitable traders. Great example there. At this point, it's in our target area. We've been targeting this since it was below $30 a share. You're gonna take off 50 to 75% of your position there. Depends on how conservative or aggressive you're as a trader. It really comes down to personal preference. Um, but then the next morning, it actually gapped up again to above $38 a share. Now, I know this happens quite often, and this is why I tweeted this out. Fubo has, has now bounced. I actually had a typo there, but it's bounced from 50% from the 26 support. Don't chase. Because what happens quite often is People will punch up the stock. They'll see, wow, it's really moving higher. You know, it, it's, it's now moved up from 35 to 40. This thing's going back to 60. People get excited. Price drives psychology. When things are moving down, people think things are going to go down forever. When things are moving up really strongly, they think they're going to move up forever. This is not the job of a professional trader. To understand the risk reward, understand where something has just come from, and whether or not we're close to potentially an area of exhaustion for buyers or an area of exhaustion for sellers. And so I tweeted this out, don't chase. And what we see now is if we look at the daily chart for Fubo, um, we're filming this right now on the following day when I said don't chase, and it's already sold off from 40 down to around $33 a share. And you can see on the daily, it's got a ways to go if it's going to pull back to this uptrend that's formed, but it's all about risk reward. The trade was over, it went from 26 to 39, it's a 50% move. On the daily, you can see that I already had 40 as a resistance on the daily chart, and you just can't chase up there. If you want to play it on the short side, what you can do is just buy some puts. When it gets up to 40, it was on Wednesday, buy the 35, 36 puts. And if it rolls over um, before Friday expiration, those puts will double or triple in value or something like that. All right, so. For, for short-term traders, our playoffs, or a Super Bowl, if you will, is earnings season, which happens four times per year. And I want to give you five things that you can do during earnings season that will help you really take advantage of the opportunities that present, present themselves. So the first item we're going to talk about is unexpected news. Um, and I want to give you an example of unexpected news. So understand, companies will release earnings, which is earnings per share, revenues, um, we'll talk about margins and things of this nature. What we're looking for in unexpected news is earnings that were much better than expected or much worse than expected. And so in this case, we're looking at our gameplay notes from during earnings season. You can see the stock that we were looking at on this particular day was CHGG. And I've circled that they both beat earnings, beat means they beat earnings estimates, and they raised guidance. So the market isn't just looking at what they did in the prior quarter, which they're just reporting. They want to know what they're doing going forward. And in this case, they raised guidance. And so that's unexpected. And so when you have unexpected news, you can have an unusually large move. So let's take a look and see what... Um, see what this, this stock did on the day uh, that they reported. So you can see from the chart that we're looking at right here, the stock actually was gapping higher from the mid 40s um, into about $50 a share once they reported. And when the market opened, um, buyers stepped in and pushed it right up into the mid 50s. And so that's example number one, unexpected news can create larger than expected um, reaction. And also a stock is more likely to trend if there's unexpected news as well. So that's our first example. The second thing you can do to crush it during earnings season is take advantage of pre-market trading. And so what pre-market trading means is we have regular market hours from 9.30 to 4 p.m. And that's when most market participants are buying and selling stocks, investing in stocks. Um, but prior to the market open, um, there's actually trading that goes on. And during earnings season, if a, if a stock reports, let's say the market closes and after 4 p.m. That, that stock reports, the next morning there'll be active trading in some of those stocks. And how can you find them? Well, number one, you can have something like the S&P Scanner, which is a tool that we use that finds things that are trading in the pre-market. Um, 
But just the two large categories generally of stocks that will trade in the pre-market are large cap technology stocks like Apple, AAPL, Facebook, FB, Netflix, NFLX, large cap technology stocks. And then also smaller biotech companies will also actively trade uh, in the pre-market. That's not necessarily just when they have earnings, but also when they have some sort of FDA approval or something like that. So let's take an example from this earnings season of something that was actively trading in the pre-market. Um, in this case, we want to take a look at Facebook. So Facebook reported earnings and was trading above $200 a share. If we look at this chart, you can see in the after hours after the report, it was above 212. We came in the next morning and it started to trade below 212. And so the most common pattern that we see in large cap technology stocks is the next morning is even when they gap higher on earnings, we'll see some sort of profit gaking in the pre-market that will extend it right to when the market opens. In the case of Facebook, if we look at this, you can see at 8 a.m. institutions, generally in the pre-market at 8 a.m. is really when the volume starts to come in. And if we look here, I circled this area of the volume that was done after 8 o'clock, it's probably close to a million, million shares that were traded between 8 and 8.30. And the technical pattern that we saw here was in the after hours, it had been above 215, it traded down to 212 where they bought it. The next morning when we came in, it was below 212. So what I'll do in this particular case is if it's below 212, when it pops back up to 212, I'll look to see if there's sellers there. If they are, that would be a spot to enter on the short side and maintain a short until the market opens because generally we'll see on large cap technology stocks right on the open, there'll be some quick profit taking. And that's how we would take advantage on, on this particular day. That's how we took advantage of Facebook. So again, large cap technology stocks, um, and small biotechs, those are the ones that have enough liquidity. It's very important that the stocks that you're trading in the pre-market have sufficient liquidity. I like to see things that have already traded several hundred thousand shares at least um, because that sufficient liquidity is what we need to control our risk. Um, another way to identify um, what we do is we'll use this, the SMB scanner um, to identify the things that are trading a lot of volume in the pre-market. In the scanner, we can sort it by volume and in the pre-market, we'll actually do volume percentage. If something's trading more than 10% of its average daily volume, we know that's being active in the pre-market. If you want to learn more, the third thing that you can do to crush it during earnings season is identify certain price behaviors or pattern that are repeating themselves during earnings season. We see this every single quarter. At the beginning of earnings season, we'll notice a particular pattern or price behavior. And once we've noticed that, what we can do is apply it to the next company that's similar that reports um, after the first one that starts to establish the pattern. So let's take a look at an example in this past week that happened during earnings season. And this price pattern behavior was actually in big box retail. And so what you'll see is similar industry stocks are bought or sold after the report. And this could be, they might report good earnings and good earnings report and they're sold. And so in this particular example, what we saw was Walmart had good numbers. And if we take a look at the pattern, here's the Walmart chart. Notice that it was gapping higher on earnings. Um, it was in the 130s in the pre-market, but when the market opened, the first move was down. Two big red bars here. Um, and so we were looking to see if this, in this particular case at Walmart, if it was sold on the open and was below 130, we would look to see if it trended lower for the day and actually took advantage of that, of that pattern. And we took advantage of it intraday. I actually tweeted it out. I think Walmart's been for sale since the open. I tweeted that out when it was about 129. Over the next few hours, it traded all the way down to 125. So the next day, when we saw Target, which is a similar industry, similar company, they reported as well. Well, let's see what happens on the open. If the first move is down on the open, um, then we will we'll short this one as well if it's, behold, if it's below one of our key levels. And so in this case, first move was down on the open. 123 was a key level for us. So once it starts to hold below 123, we play this one on the short side. And this one went all the way down to about 119 or so. Um, and so this is an example of similar price behavior, similar price pattern. So that was number three. What was our, our fourth? Our fourth thing that we can do to crush it during earnings season is narrow your focus. Very important. During earnings season, there's going to be dozens of stocks in the middle of earnings season reporting each day. you got to narrow your focus. When you've seen me share the, our morning game plan um, in prior videos, what you can see is I have a list of a few names in play, a few names second day in technical plays. Um, I narrow my list. Well, what's the process I actually go through to narrow? Um, and again, I, I spent 30 minutes on this in, in trading, at tradingworkshop.com. Um, and you can you know watch that 30 minutes. But just a quick you know one-minute recap of kind of a couple of things that I do to kind of narrow the names. If you look at the SMB scanner here, narrowing your focus... There's three criteria you can use. Average volume, average daily volume, volume percentage in the pre-market, and ETR. And so even though on the scanner, you look here, you see dozens of names that are in play, um, I'm gonna gravitate towards things that have average daily volume that are above 1 million shares per day, but perhaps below 10 million. So I wanna have things that are liquid enough that I can move in and out easily. But at the same time, um, you know, once you get that volume over a million shares per day, the spread's also gonna be narrower. If something has an average daily volume of 500,000 shares, um, I might still trade it if it's super, super in play, meaning the volume percentage that it's reported in the pre-market is, let's say, above 50% of the pre-market or higher. But at those at that lower level of average daily volume, the spread will tend to be wider. So there's, there's a kind of a sweet spot of an average daily volume once it gets into the millions um, where you're going to have sufficient liquidity. And of course, if it has a strong catalyst and is very in play, meaning volume percentage um, is above, let's say, 10% of the pre-market at least, um, you're going to you're going to be able to move that towards the top of your list. And then ATR is the other one that I circled here. ATR is the average true range, when it moves, when a stock will move on average from close to the next close. And something that has a minimum of a dollar ATR, that's something that's going to move up my list as well. And again, if you want 30 minutes of this kind of stock selection process that I've developed over the years, just check it out at tradingworkshop.com. Um, so that, that, that is, I think that's the fourth thing. I said I would give you five things. Um, and then the final one is follow-up. This one is really, really important. And the most experienced traders, traders who have been trading for more five, five or 10 years, they make a lot of extra money on the follow-up trade. So let me give you an example from this earning season from the other day. So on applied materials, they reported in line, but if we look at the actual news, 
we can see that they expected Q3 robust demand for typical double-digit sales growth. And I think that's the reason, if we look at the other piece of news that I shared, I circled three raised price targets. There were very large raised price targets. Understand with the EMAT, it's not a momentum stock. It's a large cap technology semiconductor equipment maker. It's pretty big deal. If they get raised price targets in the 15 to 20% range, that's big. This is not a, like a momentum stock. And so this was on my radar. And if we look at the actual price action, let's like take a look at how it reacted um, after it reported numbers. Um, it went up initially to the mid 50s, high 50s. And the next morning when we were looking at it, it had come back down to the low 50s. Um, if we look at our game plan notes, we had support at 50, 51, 52, inflection 53, meaning if it was above 53, we would look for it to create to our resistance areas, perhaps close at the high with all these upgrades and maybe take it as a swing trade. Um, but in the case of, if we look at the chart on day one, what we can see is it actually was sold in the morning. It got below 53, it couldn't hold above there, it was sold, and then it didn't do much. But follow-up means on day two, day three, have your price alert set, have a price alert at 53, have a price alert at 54, because on day one, um, sometimes the larger institutions, they just won't do anything. They'll digest the report, and on day two, day three, day four, they'll start to buy or sell depending on whether or not they like the numbers. And in this case, we had three raised price targets. We had the CEO saying double-digit growth in Q3. So for me, there's potentially upside over the coming days if institutions step in and start buying. So on day two, if you have your price alert um, at 53, 54, 53 triggers right at the open, it goes quickly up. It fails at 54, which is our resistance from day one on the sheet. But once you see that first move is up, have an alert above 53, and if it pulls back down, put out a position, risk your 50 cents. And if it closes at the high, you now have a swing position because generally institutions will buy for three days or they'll sell for three days. And if you can get this at the inflection price from day one, which was above 53, get long, um, and it closes at the high, you can take out 25 or 50% of that position and treat it as a multi-day swing. And in this case, just looking at the multi-day chart here, you can see on day three, it got all the way up to 58. If you're initiating the position there at 53 on day two with 50 cents of risk, um, it's a nice, it ends up being a 10 to one over the next few days. And so those are, you just have to remember to set your price alerts on day two um, so that if that price action follows through, that you take advantage. So just to recap for you, five things we can do to crush it during earnings season. Pay attention to unexpected news that, create, that can create very strong trends on day one. Pre-market trading, that's large cap technology and small buyer tech, tech stocks that are liquid enough for you to control your risk for pre-market trading. Price behaviors and patterns. What does this mean? Similar stocks, similar type of companies in a similar industry. What was the pattern earlier in earnings season when their competitors report? Look for that same pattern and take advantage. Narrow your focus. Understand a lot of stocks and companies will report during earnings season. You have to have a bunch of criteria to narrow your focus down. Experienced traders can only focus on two or three stocks right in the open. Obviously, when things slow down after 10 o'clock, you can have more names that you look at, but right on the open, you have to really lower that list. And then finally, follow up the one that we just covered, apply material. If something had unusually good news um, or looked like it had potential to move up in the following few days or move lower in the following few days, make sure you have those price alerts set for day two. Maybe they even go trigger until day three and take advantage when those things trigger. Hopefully this helped. Oh, and, and one final point. If you have questions about any of these five items, please, in the comment section below the video, ask your questions. Or if you're a trader and you've been trading for a while, or even if you're a newbie, um, tell us how you're taking advantage of some of these five things, how they help you improve your game plan. We all learn from each other. It's just not learning from us.